Well, they'd have done a lot more just from through eye, really. They wouldn't have had probably so many templates. Um, I mean, they would have been building a boat. We're trying to copy a boat. They would have just been probably building a boat to what trees they had. So they might have had a lovely shaped tree for the stem and a lovely shaped curved tree for the stern. And they would have gone from there and built the boat round, round the tree, basically. Whereas we sort of had to do it slightly the other way around where we're, we're trying to copy a, a boat. So we've had to make the templates, then find the trees that fit that template. So it's a little bit round the other way, but it all works out in the end. I just think that they're, they're on a completely on another level, really, to us. That's interesting. Yeah, I, yeah, their skill level is was, was on another level, especially as they're trying to make it probably on a riverbank with all mud and the tide coming in and out, and they're just doing it all by eye with, with axes. The blade itself is offset, so you have a flat side and a beveled side. So for the right for the right-handed person, all I'm doing is working down the grain. I'm just roughing out the shape. Um, we're using a natural twist in this tree. This, this tree is a very good one for us because it had a twist. So we've chosen, we've we've sided the two planks already based on the natural curve in the grain. So we're using the tree's natural shape to our advantage. So this, this is a traditional finishing uh, ax. Uh, the blade's supremely sharp. We, we keep these very sharp. And we all have to have uh, ax safety training before we're, we're let loose on the floor amongst ourselves. So having done the rough cuts with the heavier axes, um, this, this area here would be ready to start working with the fairing axe. And I would work from this, this side, so partly for safety, because this is very sharp, and if it, despite the trousers, if you, if you follow through, it will cut the leather. finished surface is surprisingly smooth. Uh, I've always been interested in working with wood. This was a an incredible opportunity to work with extremely large pieces of timber. <laughs> well, it just shows not quite there, it's not quite straight yet. No. It's just go up, just go up there so it's almost straight. Uh, right, we were, this is going to be uh, an orb made in oak, um, just for um, experimental purposes. Uh, we reckoned it was going to be quite heavy. Unfortunately, the piece of timber we were using um, developed these rather serious splits uh, called shakes, which go along with the grain. It happens when the timber dries out. Unfortunately, it happens seriously in this, so really this is not usable as an ore. So we've had to basically put it to one side and think what we can now use the timber for. It, oh, there's several days work went into this, <laughs> getting this this far. It's probably about four days, four or five days. Yeah, basically today we're going to be lifting the stem 
um, into, into place on this scarf here. Um, and we're gonna get two of the big red engine um, cranes, roll them over um, use, using strops and lift those up, wheel it over to about here, um, and then slide the uppermost section, resting it on this structure that we've made um, with the chain block and tackle. And then the uppermost section will get, will get winched up with that and the lower section with the, um, with the engine hoists. And then we'll just swing that across and then rest that on, on the top here of the scarf. Yes, very excited. <laughs> it's, a, it's going to be the time when the keel and the prow and the stern are all connected for the first time. And uh, we'll see the full shape of the boat. And it's becoming easier to imagine now what it's going to be like when it's complete and when it's on the water. That we can't get enough reach to get it into the centre. Um, you're always a little bit apprehensive because it's quite a heavy, heavy thing to be lifting up quite high. So you've always got to be conscious of health and safety and make sure people aren't walking under it or directly behind it because it's got a chance of it sliding out of the strop. That's why we quite often will put a G-clamp above the strop so that it can't slide up, especially with, with everything covered in um, Stockholm tar and, and uh, linseed oil. Everything starts to get a bit slippery. <laughs> In the original excavation in 1939, uh, there was, well, not only did they do a detailed uh, survey of the rivet layout and everything, there were two photographers, um, Mercy Lack and Barbara Wagstaff. They were keen amateurs, should we put it that way? And they took about 800 still photos, some of them in colour, some of the very earlier colour film of, uh, of uh, Ex archaeological excavations and um, so there's 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 both a, a drawing from that time and there are all the archaeological photos so we have the impression that was left in the sand during the excavation so all the rivet locations the plank edges the shapes of the frames where they crossed the stem um, so we're pretty pretty sure we've got an accurate understanding of what the stem looked like Yeah, it was a bit trying, but we, we got there. We got, it went fairly smoothly, really, in the end. Yeah, yeah, it was all in position, and um, the scarf fitted really well, so we're really pleased. This is the end of the day and this is what we do at the end of the day. So try to tidy things up so uh, when you come back in it's, you can make another mess. Oh absolutely, I'm not doing this for nothing. <laughs> first, question, first question I asked him, do I get a ride in it? He says absolutely. <laughs> I'm not doing it if I don't get a ride in it. <laughs> 